Um, okay, so let's get started with, uh, we'll start out with introductions. Um, first to uh, the couple of us from NDIA who are going to be presenting today. So my name is Aaron Schill. I'm the Director of Research and Programs at the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. Uh, and uh, in my work, I oversee our support for local communities, local governments, uh, coalitions, and other local organizations. Uh, as well as our uh, our data and research work, um, tracking trends in the field and providing resources to local communities and practitioners to help you all collect data and understand um, what is happening in uh, your communities around digital equity and what needs look like. Uh, I'm located in Portland, Oregon uh, now, uh, but I will note uh, I am from Ohio originally uh, and used to work at the uh, Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission uh, and about half of our region that we served um, were Appalachian counties. Uh, so um, have done a lot of work and, and really uh, understand um, the needs of Appalachian communities, at least in Ohio, uh, and uh, kind of some of the challenges around both broadband infrastructure and also meeting kind of the, the other surrounding digital inclusion needs of communities. So I'm really excited to be here today sharing with you and uh, excited to work with many of you over the coming months. Uh, and I will turn it over to my colleague, Katie, to introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Um, really excited to be here with you all today and was really thrilled to hear so much about your organizations. Um, I'm Katie. I'm a data and research manager at NDIA uh, for about a year now, um, and I'm located in Toronto, but I'm from Michigan originally, um, and I use she, her pronouns. So turning it back to you. All right, great, thanks. And you'll hear from Katie uh, here in a moment, as well as a couple of our LCAs. Uh, but first, a little bit about NDIA. So you're hearing a lot of acronyms thrown around. We are NDIA, the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, not to be confused with NTIA, uh, who Sean mentioned earlier and who is administering uh, funds. Um, understandable if from time to time you get those confused. Um, so NDIA, we are uh, a, a national nonprofit uh, that advances digital equity by supporting folks like you, um, doing community programs uh, in, in your communities. We support practitioners, policymakers, uh, doing digital inclusion work. Um, we are really, uh, the strength of our organization is our network of 1,500 plus affiliates across the country uh, who are doing the on the ground work. And we are just in a unique and fortunate position to be able to speak with and hear the experiences uh, across our, our entire network and bring uh, that knowledge to bear um, in terms of best practices, in terms of what's working in different communities and what needs look like. Um, so our role is to really amplify the message of folks like you that are doing this work. Um, we have affiliates in all 50 states and most territories and are working with um, 23 tribal communities as well. So that's just, a, and we are a fully remote team. So our team is spread all over the country. Um, we have folks in, uh, a lot of folks in Ohio, actually, quite a few folks in North Carolina, um, Virginia and the DC area, uh, all up and down the East Coast, uh, and a few folks kind of uh, scattered around the rest of the country as well. Uh, so about the work we do, um, we support our community and we'll be supporting all of you in your planning efforts in kind of four primary areas. Uh, so first is practitioner support. Um, as I mentioned, we learn from and then amplify the messages and best practices of practitioners doing digital inclusion work all around the country. And we'll share just a few examples of that kind of as we talk. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll show what that looks like. Um, additionally, we uh, have a policy team um, that does policy work at both the state and federal levels. Um, one example of that is the affordable connectivity program information that I shared in the chat. Uh, we are also very focused on um, the Digital Equity Act generally, um, both providing guidance and comments to NTIA that uh, on behalf of our affiliate community uh, and working with individual states as they think through their digital equity plans uh, and then begin to think about their grant programs, which uh, we'll talk much more about um, over the coming months, but Sean did a great job of summarizing. Uh, we also work on awareness, so building knowledge about and building the capacity of the digital inclusion field. Um, it's a growing, it's a relatively new field. Um, some folks, our executive director, Angela, Sam, um, some folks have been doing this for quite a while, but many of us are, are much newer to this field. So a large part of our role is building knowledge and capacity for the digital inclusion field. Uh, earlier this month, the first week of the month was Digital Inclusion Week, and we had 
um, the largest ever. There were hundreds of organizations and events across the country. Um, we looked at like the reach of our media impacts across the country uh, for folks engaged in Digital Inclusion Week, and it was something like over 900 million media impacts across the country. So just like phenomenal numbers, um, all kinds of, uh, of work, great work being done and highlighted uh, during Digital Inclusion Week. And then lastly, uh, a piece that is very close to uh, both myself and Katie's work, uh, which is our data and research. So again, helping you all understand what does digital inclusion look like in your community uh, and, um, and then uh, building knowledge and, and identifying what works best, doing evaluation of different programs to understand how do we do this work more effectively. Um, so that's just a quick intro to NDIA. Uh, and hopefully gives you a, a little taste of how um, we'll be working with y'all and supporting y'all in your planning efforts going forward. Um, so I want to do next just a little bit of level setting before we kind of get into um, an introduction to digital inclusion more specifically. Uh, and to do that, we're going to, um, oh, I forgot, we have some resources. If you are quick with your camera, you can scan this QR code right now. If you are not um, don't worry, it's going to come back up at the end. So if you don't catch it now, I'm not going to dwell on this. Um, you'll be able to scan the same QR code at the end and just get a lot of um, a list of resources that are available on our site. Um, but before we dive into it, I want to just do some level setting with some definitions, just so we have common terminology and kind of understand when we use certain terms, what do we mean? Uh, and, um, and just kind of begin from that basic foundation of common understanding. Uh, so the first term I, I know many of you are familiar with, um, you've heard this term, you're using it all the time, the digital divide. Um, when we speak about the digital divide, we are talking about the issue we are dealing with. Um, so specifically, it's the gap between those who do have affordable access skills and the support necessary to effectively engage online and those who don't. Uh, and most importantly, we know that that doesn't affect everyone equally. So folks in lower income communities, rural communities, communities of color, um, are disproportionately impacted by the digital divide. Uh, the next term that uh, I want to define is digital equity. Um, and that's the goal we're working towards. So that's kind of what, what we are striving to achieve. We know that it is a never ending goal. We will always be working toward um, this, this kind of long term goal, uh, the condition where all individuals have the technology capacity needed to fully participate in society democracy and the economy. Uh, and the way we do that, the work that we do is what we refer to as digital inclusion. Uh, so digital inclusion are the specific activities. Digital inclusion is what you all are going to be developing plans for. Um, so it's getting people access to affordable home broadband, um, appropriate and affordable devices to take advantage of, of uh, that broadband service. Uh, the skills that you need to to really um, to leverage those resources and do what you need to do online, uh, along with ongoing technical support and all the applications that um, that uh, we you know we all use every day, uh, including being on the Zoom call um, with dozens of us from across the country. Um, all of that work and and helping people access all these resources is digital inclusion. Uh, I should note that. Uh, these are not terms that we as staff at NDIA came up with. Uh, these, like most of our work, were informed by and developed by our community. So we worked with um, practitioners across the country to understand how are they using these terms and what do they mean in their work. Uh, and that's what this reflects. And that will be a consistent theme throughout the resources we share with you um, throughout our work with you is uh, we will be sharing uh, the work that we hear from communities across the country. We'll be sharing things that we know work, uh, and we'll do our best to um, point out uh, examples that are most relevant. So uh, we're not going to uh, necessarily say they had this great program in downtown LA, um, and so you should try to implement that in your relatively smaller uh, community or county. Um, we're going to be sharing a lot of um, information and resources from communities that are that are either in Appalachia or are comparable uh, in terms of how they're doing the work. And again, we'll highlight a couple of those now. Um, our goal today is just to give a quick taste uh, and introduction to digital inclusion and how we um, think about that and can support your planning efforts. Uh, hopefully that will spur some questions. So please feel free to put questions in the chat. Uh, and then we'll have a lot more conversation um, going forward about, uh, about specifically how this looks and works in your community. So I'm gonna put you on the spot. Uh, 
for a moment. Um, a lot of times we do this in like breakout rooms and we ask people to talk about this. We have a lot of people and we don't have the time to do that. So what I'm going to ask you all to do is uh, answer this question in the chat. Um, so would love to hear uh, from your perspective and from what you know, which you maybe you're just kind of getting into the digital inclusion space and just beginning to think about this, um, but would love to hear uh, what prevents people in your community from consistently connecting to the internet and using it effectively? Uh, so feel free to just put, uh, it doesn't have to be anything revolutionary. It can be the most obvious things, um, but would love to hear a few examples uh, in the chat. So I'm going to pause here for a moment and give everybody a couple moments to think and start dropping in some some thoughts. All right, I'm seeing a couple cost, uh, several cost barriers, absolutely. So affordability of internet, affordability of devices, um, a few uh, lack of skills or lack of time uh, to learn how to take advantage of it. Uh, a really interesting uh, comment from Ashley, not understanding the benefits. So if you don't know what you don't know, uh, if you don't know what's available to you, uh, you may not prioritize it. And we hear that a lot. We hear, you know, when, when asked why people don't have the internet, some people will say like, I don't really need it. It's not that important. And that may be true in some cases, but in a lot of cases, if you don't know um, what information and resources are available to you, uh, you're not going to know, uh, that's not going to be a priority to you. Uh, JP, great. Intimidation by technology. Um, fear, shame, uh, intimidation are all huge barriers to people particularly older adults, particularly we see people in rural communities um, that feel like they're behind and it's really hard to catch up and don't want to, don't necessarily want to ask for help. Um, online security uh, is a huge issue. I'm also seeing a few saying underserved or unserved areas. Uh, so both of those are, are huge challenges. Great. So these are all, um, these are all fantastic examples. Uh, and these are the reasons why digital inclusion uh, should be a priority uh, and is a priority to folks in your community, even if they're not calling it that. Um, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to actually turn it over to a couple of our lead community agency partners. Uh, first, uh, we're going to hear from um, Colby with uh, Shaping Our Appalachian Region in Kentucky, and then we're going to hear from Annie at Generation West Virginia. And they're just going to very quickly share from their perspective and their organizations and their community, why is digital equity important to them and why are they getting into this work? Uh, so uh, I'm gonna turn it over first to Colby. Thanks, Aaron, can you hear me okay? Yes. Awesome, awesome. Well, it's great to be here. It's great to see so many um, friends and familiar faces in, in, in the chat and um, just on the call. So I'm Colby Hall, I'm the executive director of Wait for it, SOAR, another acronym. So we'll add that to the acronym list and keep whoever is taking meeting notes very busy, which stands for Shaping Our Appalachian Region. And so um, who we are, um, we're a, a nonprofit that focuses um, on regional economic development in Eastern Kentucky, specifically the 54 Appalachian Regional Commission counties in Eastern Kentucky. Um, our organization is uh, a convener, we're a connector, and um, that's why I'm, I'm so grateful for uh, some of our direct funders and partners on this call. So I definitely want to um, shout out and thank the Appalachian Regional Commission specifically for their support of our organization, uh, Connect Humanity, who has become a, a, a new friend and somebody that we've worked very, very closely with over the last uh, two years or so, and, and they've been a wonderful resource um, the FCC, we were an ACP uh, outreach grant recipient, and then the NDIA, as we have a, a digital navigator, Ashley, on, on our team. So um, who we work with, uh, or I guess in, in terms of Aaron, when I read that question and, and who I think you were, you were targeting, I guess in terms of this um, this conversation, um, you know, our region is home to some of the most economically distressed communities, um, you know, in the country. So uh, what what entails in that it's it's low income households it's individuals without um, high school degrees it's individuals without college degrees it's justice involved populations it's 
um, individuals with substance use disorder. Um, and so a lot of those barriers have led to Eastern Kentucky's um, workforce um, being in a, in, a, in a pretty challenging position, um, specifically something that we track called the prime age um, employment rate, uh, which is the, the, the percentage of individuals that are 25 to, to, to 54 years old. Um, that's kind of the bedrock of your workforce. And what we know in Eastern Kentucky is, you know, nationally, that number is about 80%. Uh, for us, that, that number is closer to 50%, which means we have tens of thousands of individuals that are in that age gap that are on the sidelines that really our communities need um, to fill existing jobs and to create new jobs. Um, and that's something that's at, that, at the top of our, of our list. And so our organization was started when the coal economy collapsed um, around the Great Recession time. Um, so jobs and opportunity and prosperity has always been at the heart of, of SOAR and SOAR's mission in Eastern Kentucky. Uh, and that's why we're so excited about, about digital equity and this idea for these tens of thousands of, of people that are, that are seeking opportunity or that are on the sidelines. Um, you know, if there is a silver bullet uh, if there is a magic wand that we can wave, we think it's the internet. We think it's the opportunities that the internet provides. We think it's it's the the equalizing ability of of, of the internet to, to to bring in new opportunities to the region that maybe other sectors can't do all all, all by themselves. And so, some of the ways that we've um, been going about it. And Aaron, if you want to hit next, um, my my next slide. Uh, and here's just some of what I, I just said. Um, we've created an office of digital equity in Eastern Kentucky, and I've got a, a really awesome team um, uh, behind me or that's working, you know, hand in hand with communities on the ground. I want to call out uh, Kim Albright, who I believe is on this call, and Ashley Smith, our digital navigator, and Kelly Pine, who is our digital equity coordinator that is supported by our FCC ACP outreach grant, uh, as well as Josh Ball on our team. And so what we've done is We've created this ecosystem of resources where we try to meet individual people where they are. So kind of our entry point or what we think is like kind of the earliest stage is help signing up for the affordable connectivity program, which I won't you know get in as it's been talked about um, a, a bunch already. But we feel like, you know, for folks that don't know that there's thirty dollars a month that they can take off their Internet bill, we're going to help make sure they know about it and help sign them up. So that's a great a service that we can offer and, and something that we've been really successful in doing. Um, device distribution. Um, so our aim, again, going back to that job focus is, is our belief that uh, if somebody is, um, you know, trying to, if they need uh, equipment or if they need a device because they're trying to go back to school or they're looking for some sort of training or they're trying to apply for jobs or, you know, pursue a remote career or pursue any career, right, where a laptop or, or some sort of of, of, of electronic devices needed, we're in a position that, that we can provide that device for them uh, and really make sure that, um, um, that, they're, that they're getting the full benefit of, of the internet there. So we do some device distribution, um, digital skilling. So um, trying to do some workshops here and there to be able to help folks get that baseline, those baseline sets of skills needed to be able to, to leverage the internet to their benefit. Uh, employment search assistance, remote job fairs. Um, so uh, that entry level job, or, or maybe some of the that 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 um, uh, bridge career, that first job for for somebody, right? Just you know, put yourself in their shoes. Somebody that maybe just got out of the justice system, or maybe is coming back from substance use disorder. I mean, they're they've they've got a there's a pathway for them to follow, or they're not just gonna you know go go straight into a a very high you know high skilled high paying job out of there. So we we feel like we have to create some sort of pathway for them, or some sort of you know stepping stone. Um, into careers like that. And, and we have some relationships with remote employers that we bring together to be able to employ folks in entry level positions, but positions that pay quite well, that can allow people to stay inside their communities and work from home if that's something that fits them. And then kind of on the, um, um, the higher side or, or the higher skilled side of what we do, we have a really cool program called Code Kentucky that's in partnership with the uh, Workforce Innovation Board, actually out of Louisville, Kentucky. It's modeled after a program called Code Louisville, which is a national model. Um, that's a free six month program for folks that are um, trying to get into um, uh, software development type roles or technology adjacent roles. I don't wanna say it's just software development because you know, for um, let's say for banks or for hospitals, folks that have specific IT needs, we know that these types of positions are needed by those employers as well. So it's an opportunity for maybe somebody that comes in and has been with us for a while and they're continuing to work up 
um, this is a, a, a program that could be a great fit for them and, and to try to get them into uh, you know, higher paying, high skill, skill positions. So um, I'll just wrap it up. You know, Aaron, um, we are super excited about as this conversation transitions, as we make assumptions around the, the 42.25 billion that every community gets access to the internet, the conversation is, is gonna move to what do we do with the internet? Um, it's already there, right? Um, and that's the million dollar question because we can we can have this 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 complicated real estate construction project. Um, you know, we can go out and buy a, a beautiful new car, but if it, if it doesn't have any wheels, it doesn't go anywhere, right? And so uh, we feel like the, the million dollar question in Eastern Kentucky is going to make sure that folks know how to leverage this uh, asset to 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 their full benefit, to their individual benefit, because it's really about those individual people. Um, that, that are going to be using it. And um, at SOAR, you know, we don't have bucket trucks. We don't have, um, you know, rolls of fiber. Uh, I don't have the ability to climb up a telephone pole and hang it, but I do have a great team behind me and we can help folks know how to use the internet better uh, to help themselves and help their families. And so we're super excited to do that. And the last thing I think you said is a lesson you've learned, um, celebrate the small wins. Uh, in Eastern Kentucky, like in other parts of Appalachia, it's a lot of big stuff we're trying to solve. It's a lot of stuff that if you allow yourself to get swallowed by it, um, you don't sleep great at night because this is something that you're passionate about. And I I need sleep. I think everybody here on the call needs sleep. So I try to tell my team and we at SOAR try not to get so caught up in those big, big numbers that get really hairy and really scary. And I think what's important in this work um, is to think about those individual people that we're, that we're supporting. And um, while, you know, it may seem small in a grant application, right, the impact that you have helping one person get connected to the internet, get remote employment, um, there's ripple effects there into what that means in their communities and their families. And we have tons of examples of those. So that's what I'll finish with, Aaron, is, is celebrate the small wins and don't discount helping that next person in front of you. So thanks all for listening and thank you for your time. Great. Thanks so much, Colby. Uh, really inspiring work. And uh, you're seeing some notes in the chat uh, about that also. Uh, I'm now going to turn it over to Annie Stroud with uh, Generation West Virginia to talk about their work uh, in neighboring West Virginia. Great. Thanks, everybody. And thanks, Colby. It's nice to hear you talk about your work again. I got a chance to connect uh, with them just the other day and hear a little bit more. Um, so my name is Annie Stroud. I am the Broadband Program Director at Generation West Virginia, um, and we are the technically lead community agency in West Virginia. Um, we are also partnering uh, with Regional Optical Communications, or ROC, um, which is a consortium of a couple of different regions, um, specifically for those 18 counties in West Virginia. Um, so Generation West Virginia, um, is a statewide organization whose mission is actually focused on attracting, retaining, advancing young people in West Virginia. Um, it's been around for quite some time. I am new to the organization. I just started in April. And we offer a variety of programs from a uh, you know, software training program, professional development fellowship, some like career connector services. Um, and in 2020, um, in working with a, a funder who's done a lot of good work in West Virginia, um, we kind of looked at the fact that uh, West Virginia was not getting federal funding for broadband deployment when surrounding states were successfully doing that. And so they approached us and said, hey, can we do a pilot program where um, you all would be kind of the, the wraparound technical assistance resource for communities to help them write grants? So our background is really infrastructure. Um, we don't build the infrastructure, you know, like Colby, but our whole program has been built around how do we fill in the gaps from what is already available from existing technical service um, providers um, and be able to, you know, get people across the line when it comes to um, specific infrastructure development. So, you know, this slide here, the, the first piece I guess I want to talk about, because I know we're mostly talking about digital equity, but, you know, in, in West Virginia, as we heard earlier, a lot of unserved addresses. So a big push initially was just like, how do we get people connected or at least on the list? How do we get these projects funded? They might not be connected now, but in the next couple of years, we should be seeing that. So there was a big push around that. Um, we worked closely again with ROC to do a statewide planning study. So we actually have this high level cost and routing for um, the un and underserved addresses. And that's what the on the side here, this kind of map on the left is. Um, 
kind of an example of what a county is going to receive out of this rock study. But, you know, as the landscape has shifted around um, broadband funding and with the bead funds coming down, which are going to cover a lot of the actual like physical infrastructure, um, you know, for us, we really were kind of thinking about, okay, how do we shift what we're doing and respond to the needs of the actual communities? Because the biggest need right now isn't some communities are still going to need some grant writing assistance to, to apply for federal funds that aren't going to qualify for BEAD for various reasons. But, you know, the next big hurdle is how do people use this resource that's coming their way? Again, we're still a little bit ahead of the game because they don't have it yet. Most of them are stuck in permitting. If anyone does infrastructure work, you know, that's kind of where we're at. Um, you know, but where where can we support communities and thinking about how to help their people access this resource. So, you know, honestly, we're fairly new to digital equity compared to a lot of the, the other folks on this call. Um, and, you know, on our poll, that's that's the piece that I think we're going to need the most support on is, is how do we develop programs that work for all of these folks, you know, but like, you know, Colby was saying, we have a lot of the same challenges around if people even have internet access, how do we make sure they understand why it's something useful to them, make them understand the tools that are available to them through telehealth, through education, through, you know, parents being able to interact with, you know, the school systems, messaging apps and programming. Um, you know, there's, there's so many reasons why it's so, so important. Um, you know, but for us, I think as far as our approach here is the states defined, you know, some kind of like high level digital equity goals, but one challenge, I guess, that um, we're thinking about is a lot of the communities that we're working in because they haven't had internet service, um, you know, the discussion of what digital equity and digital inclusion looks like is a little bit challenging when people don't have that resource, I guess, you know, so I think, I think in our framing of the project, that's going to be something we're definitely going to kind of be thinking about and, and working on. Again, we've got support from the state planning process, and we're really excited about that. But I think, you know, again, going back to the lessons learned, um, for us, being able, again, to kind of pivot and meet a community and meet the needs of what's actually going on on the ground is the biggest thing, you know, as an organization that comes in to fill the gaps and provide, you know, have the flexibility to meet uh, needs that agencies and federal structures aren't able to do, being able to kind of say like, okay, well, maybe we did this for three years and it was great, but that's not actually where we what we need anymore, so let's not keep banging down that door and think about how we can pivot and use our networks and resources to meet the next kind of challenge that's coming down the pike. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, so thank you both uh, Colby and Annie for, for sharing from your perspective. Um, and uh, you know, I think part of the work as, as was shared earlier is going to be developing cohorts around this. So we're hearing, you know, just heard from two organizations that may be in different stages of developing resources and programs, but are facing a lot of the same issues. So what we're looking forward to over the next several months is, um, is how that sharing works and and how you all kind of compare notes and and learn from each other um, in what will work best and how to address some of these challenges. Uh, so we're going to spend the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes um, just kind of talking a, a little more specifically about uh, those um, some digital equity challenges that are commonly seen and how some folks are working to address those. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, to my colleague Katie. Hi, everyone. Yeah, so um, when we're talking about barriers to digital inclusion. I think I saw a lot of um, the barriers that we notice across the U.S. Um, come up in the things you guys were mentioning in the chat. Um, so we think about barriers kind of like broadly in three categories. Um, so there's barriers to broadband, there's barriers to accessing of devices, and then, you know, digital skills becomes a barrier to <laughs> using those devices or that connection that you even if you're able to get those. So um, under broadband, um, like a huge issue that I saw a lot of you guys mention as well as cost being a barrier. Um, you know, broadband 
uh, high like high speed internet connection can be quite expensive and outside the range of what people can afford. And even if they can't afford it one month, maybe not the next. Um, and uh, even with a connection, sometimes unreliable service can be a barrier. I mean, like if you have a connection, but you can't rely on it being consistent during what you need to be doing, um, then you know, you might as well not have it. Like you have to be able to rely on your connection being consistent, especially if you're doing, you know, like a telehealth call or something really important like that. Um, and then another barrier we see in broadband is um, in digital redlining. So um, that that refers to like specific practices um, from internet service providers uh, that, you know, we see higher prices and lower quality of service. Um, and lower relative prices and higher quality of service in areas um, that we like see lower qualities of service in areas that are historically marginalized in the first place. Um, so we have a lot of information about digital redlining studies on our website, and it's really interesting to look into that. Um, and with devices, um, another another area where affordability is a huge issue. Um, especially because laptops can be like hundreds of dollars if a laptop is what you need. Um, and another huge thing that comes up under devices is outdated software, um, especially like technology is evolving so fast. I mean, it's a cliche to say at this point, but it's always true. Like the programs and software that we use 10 years ago are sometimes irrelevant now. So keeping those up to speed is an additional cost. I mean, you can't just expect to like buy a laptop and then <laughs> you're set for life. Unfortunately, there's the maintenance and the upkeep costs that kind of continue on. Um, and that can be a huge barrier um, to folks being able to uh, stay connected and stay digitally included. Um, and then another like area of issues is devices not matching um, the needs that users have. Um, so for instance, like smartphones are really helpful and you can, you might be able to like connect to your email and your Slack and your LinkedIn and, uh, it might help your work life in that way, but, um, it might not be adequate for you to use a word document to create a report or like, um, be able to write your resume. Um, you might need like a laptop in order to, uh, do all those things. So, um, having a device that matches your needs is another barrier that folks face. Um, and then under digital skills, um, uh, one like major uh, barrier to digital inclusion is just having limited skills and especially like limited foundational skills and the kind of fear and shame that comes along with that. I think I'm, I, I noticed someone mentioning like the Im intimidation of technology and um, the kind of fear also of being scammed or having your information, um, your like private data out there and not knowing how it's being used. It's like not knowing that kind of fear and also like that feeling of being left behind, like everything is moving so fast and that kind of feeling of like, how am I ever gonna get caught up to all this stuff that's changing around me? Those can be really, big barriers and like some of the most difficult to break down um, but really vital to helping folks um, get online and and meet their goals online um, and just kind of showing folks that everyone is in the same boat on some level or another of um, learning about technology um, and yeah along with digital skill barriers um, uh, trainings being accessible um, is another barrier, especially with um, foundational skills. Um, it can be even once someone overcomes that that initial like shame and fear and wants to learn more about how to use technology, if the if there's nothing available in their area, you know, it it becomes another barrier to them being able to access that. So luckily, um, <laughs> the solutions we uh, also have kind of. Uh, collected and, and developed through communication with our um, community at NDIA, and they fall into the same kind of categories. So 
um, providing access to affordable broadband, appropriate devices, and digital skills training are how we can help overcome this divide and these barriers. Um, so just briefly looking at these solutions, um, affordable, no cost broadband um, can help folks access broadband. Um, and when we're talking about broadband, that's just, uh, you know, the internet, high speed internet. Um, and the way FCC defines that um, in a definition developed like almost 10 years ago at this point is 25 megabits downloading and three megabits uploading. Um, but, you know, uh, a study from um, the Deloitte Tech Trend survey shows that the average number of connected devices in the American household is um, 21. So if you have 21 devices connected to the internet in your house and you're trying to use a 25.3 um, internet speed, it's going to be really slow and painful. <laughs> um, so that just goes to show that this is already kind of an out of date figure. Um, and the standard is moving towards 120 being the minimum uh, acceptable standard of high to, to be defined as high speed internet. Um, but even 120, a lot of households need more than that, especially if there's folks doing um, like video calls all at the same time. Um, so with broadband adoption, um, we're talking about like ha folks having the ability to access the internet daily um, at the speed that they uh, need in order to accomplish their goals and the tasks they want to accomplish. Um, so for some people that could be slower, for other folks it might need to be higher, but we're really looking at this from the perspective that everyone deserves to have <laughs> the connection they need to do what they need to do. Um, uh, so quick trivia question, if you were paying close attention to Sean's presentation, you might find this easier, but um, what city was ranked the best work from home city in 2021 by PC Mag? Maybe just put your, put your responses in the chat. A, B, C, or D, San Fran, New York, San Antonio, or Chattanooga. Oh, yeah, you guys were paying attention. <laughs> yeah, lots of D. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, Ch Chattanooga is known as the gig city because um, as yeah, Sean went over, um, they have rolled out a citywide fiber network way back in 2010 so they're ahead of the curve so it's great to see a city like this in Appalachia um, providing that fiber connection to every household cool and then another huge um, area of so like the solutions to the digital divide is providing appropriate and affordable devices um, so yeah I won't go too much into this but appropriate just thinking back to like you know, can you use a cell phone to do your all of the things you need for work? Probably not. But can you lug around a, a laptop in your pocket and take calls from that everywhere you go? Probably not. So there's different devices that we need for different needs. Um, and it's it's there's not a one size fits all approach in terms of um, what devices people need to accomplish their goals. Um, so just calling out a cool example. Um, from Pittsburgh, there's an organization called Computer Reach, um, and what they do is they run a refurbishment, so they take broken down computers, refurbish them, and then provide them for a low or no cost to community members. Um, so, you know, this this is a great program, um, as I mentioned, in Pittsburgh, which in something like this might not yet exist in your community, but there's national level organizations that can help you fill this device need um, with refurbished and low cost devices. Um, and if you want to be connected to those, please like reach out to Aaron or I. Um, an example is PCs for People, and we know they work in Ohio and Illinois. Um, and then uh, there's another organization called Digitunity, um, which works nationally to increase the supply of those uh, low cost or no cost computers um, and help create the connections between uh, folks handing out those computers and refurbishers. Um, so um, looking at digital skills training, when we're talking about this, again, we're looking at foundational digital skills, um, like thinking about like 
you know, before you can uh, run, you have to walk um, and being able to use, you know, your mouse and a keyboard and turn on the computer and remember your password are all these steps in order to even be able to use email, right? So um, like when we're talking about digital skills, really thinking about um, all the different pieces of the puzzle that folks um, might need to be able to put together to get where they need to go. And an example of an organization working um, uh, with a kind of comprehensive digital skills solution is um, Digital Connect Initiative in the Gila River Indian community. Um, and they help with device setup, uh, emails, apps. They help folks use Zoom or like web conferencing software. Um, they have a digital navigator program um, that's part of our National Digital Navigator Corps at NDAA. Um, and yeah, it's, a, it's just a great uh, kind of model of, of program and I encourage you guys to look into it more um, but for the sake of time um, another so like when uh, digital navigators I, I heard a few of you mentioned digital navigators before and I know we have one on the call as well <laughs> um, but this is kind of like a person who holistically uh, connects community members to all these different um, solutions <laughs> that I mentioned so it's someone who can help uh, provide one-on-one -on -one support with a community member to know where to access affordable broadband, know how to acquire an appropriate device, and know and help them gain those digital skills, whether it's teaching them those foundational skills or helping them get access to other trainings and further studies that they might want to do. Um, so we have a great digital navigator resource page with the um, digital navigator like program model available and a toolkit to help start up a program like that if you're interested, um, along with a lot of great resources. And um, yeah, totally encourage you all to check that out. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Aaron. Great, thanks Katie. Um, and yeah, a few people mentioned digital navigators. That is one of two kind of like holistic digital inclusion strategies that um, we have found works particularly well. And we've worked with members of our community to build the model and kind of um, replicate across the country. Uh, so please check out those resources um, if that seems like a good fit um, or if you want to learn more. Uh, the other, oops, we're going to skip you also. the, sorry about that. We're going to skip the video for now. Uh, the other is digital inclusion coalitions, um, which I mentioned briefly before. Um, but coalitions are collectives of organizations in a community uh, that address or are currently addressing or could address digital inclusion needs. Um, they often pool together to raise funding or to go apply for funding um, from something like your state uh, Digital Equity Act funds. Um, they also raise awareness about digital inequities in your community. So the things that Colby and Annie just shared that they're seeing in their communities, coalitions come together. Um, it's very similar if you're familiar with the collective impact model, um, the coalition model that we've kind of worked with our community to develop looks very similar to collective impact. Um, but it's bringing together uh, a number of different types of organizations to address digital inclusion needs holistically in the community. Uh, so we pool, we polled coalitions across the country. Um, that map that uh, you just saw is a little outdated. Um, we know that there are more that was done about a year and a half ago, uh, but there was a glaring uh, lack of coalitions across the Appalachian region with the exception of North Carolina, where there's a whole mess of them in North Carolina. Um, but a lot of uh, states you're in um, don't currently have coalitions, uh, and that's one of the things that we might encourage you to consider. So of the 52 coalitions we surveyed, um, 49 of them are consist of nonprofits, 46 have libraries, uh, most have some educational institutions, you see local government, workforce development organizations. A lot of these look like the organizations that you all represent uh, or that you partner with already. Uh, many of these organizations may be doing digital inclusion work already, but don't think about it that in those terms. Uh, and so bringing together a coalition helps people understand how they fit into the into the digital equity ecosystem and how they have a role in helping to address these challenges. So uh, as you engage in your planning process, we would really encourage you to think about um, how to build a coalition and build capacity in your community. Uh, and again, we have uh, a coalition guidebook, lots of resources. You'll notice that there are links kind of scattered throughout these slides. Uh, that resource page that I mentioned earlier and we'll pop back up here in just a moment has access to all of those links uh, and we can also make these slides available. 
Uh, so if you're interested, please feel free to join the NDIA community. Uh, Sam put a link in the chat earlier. Uh, it is free to join as an affiliate and um, provides access to our very robust and active listserv, uh, community calls and others. Um, I'm not going to do a big sales pitch, but if you're interested, you can find more on our site. Uh, here's that resource uh, link again. So I'll leave this up here for just a moment as we wrap up. Um, so just want to say thank you all for the chance to share kind of the intro to digital inclusion. Um, this is just the start of our work. Uh, our hope here today was just to hopefully pique your interest and maybe raise some questions uh, and, and maybe help you start thinking about how do you approach this work? How do you think about some of the challenges in your own community? Uh, and just give you a taste of how some other organizations and communities are starting to address some of these, these needs. So uh, we look forward to, to working with you all uh, as you get into the plans. Um, and uh, as Katie said before, please feel free to reach out to either of us. We'll drop our emails in the chat if you have questions. Uh, and uh, with that, I think we will uh, wrap up and turn it back over to, uh, to Sarah. <laughs>